Thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. Can I too begin by recognising the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this afternoon, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects and my thanks to their elders past, present and emerging. And a very warm welcome to Curtin University and to our annual Human Rights Lecture. It is wonderful to see so many people here this afternoon so obviously interested in the state of human rights in Australia. We are extremely honoured that this year's lecture will be delivered by the inspirational Dr Waleed Ali. A deep commitment to human rights goes to the very core of strong, effective and healthy democracies. But there are threats. As Waleed will argue, there is a risk that the current political dynamics are sidelining human rights, a move that creates a vacuum available to be filled by more assertive and negative forms of nationalism. Our annual human rights lecture was established to support and encourage a strong human rights culture, both within and outside the university. This is a responsibility that we all share, a sentiment that was beautifully captured by Eleanor Roosevelt when she addressed the United Nations back in 1958, and I quote, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any map of the world. Such are the places where every man, woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. I congratulate Baden and his colleagues for hosting this lecture and for the important education, research and advocacy that they undertake within the university's Centre for Human Rights Education. Education is, as we all know, critically important if we are to ensure that we live in a nation where human rights are fully realised and social justice is enjoyed by all. We have a responsibility to ensure that our students are educated in an environment where understanding, ideas and views are shaped and challenged by facts and evidence, by open debate and by deep reflection. As we see increasing signs on the global stage of fear and anxiety, it is this role of universities that is so critical to our future a future where the protection of human rights must remain a core and fundamental value. As Waleed will argue, human rights need to regain their persuasive power, in his words, to rediscover a way to become enchanted, imbued with some politically compelling meaning. From the project to ABC's The Minefield, The Guardian to The Monthly, Waleed uses his work to do just this, to demystify and diffuse the polarised views attached to everyday issues and world events alike. He is a broadcaster, an author, an academic, a musician, and widely regarded as one of Australia's most respected and multi-skilled media talents. Waleed is co-host of Network 10's The Project. He has also hosted the morning program for ABC Radio in Melbourne and presented political analysis on Q&A in BBC World, as well as making regular appearances on Meet the Press, The 7.30 Report and Offsiders. In 2014, he was awarded the prestigious Walkley Award for commentary, analysis, opinion and critique. In 2016, he won the Gold Logie Award for the most popular Australian TV personality and Silver Logie Award for best presenter. And in 2017, he picked up another silver logie for best presenter. While Eid's social and political commentary has produced an award-winning book entitled People Like Us, How Arrogance is Dividing Islam and the West. While Eid originally studied chemical engineering and law at the University of Melbourne and recently received his PhD from Monash University. He is now a lecturer in politics at Monash working in their Global Terrorism Research Centre. And when he's not broadcasting and writing, he's usually involved in something musical. As the ABC noted, Waleed is probably the only Australian academic to have trended on Twitter twice and to have written a formal, harmonic and structural analysis of the great hit, 
Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Waleed, we are honoured that you agreed to present the 2017 annual Curtin University Human Rights Lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr Waleed Ali to the podium. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Thank you very much for coming out. And I, I proceed, of course, um, in the comfort of knowing that we've been welcome to the country and um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered today. Um, and I do want to point out, it, it is actually a rhapsody. Um, it's, it's remarkable. Um, I think Freddie Mercury knew what he meant with that title, because uh, I, I always thought of that song as being three songs just stuck together. But when you do the analysis, you actually find that there are five different sections. And what sounds reiterative is actually a different section in its own right, and it's therefore through composed and follows no conventional form, thus being a rhapsody. So, uh, dinner parties all across Perth are going to be set aflame with the knowledge that you've just been granted. Um, thanks for having me again. Uh, thank you for the invitation, by the way, Baden. And um, it's, it was a wonderful thing to be able to accept because because uh, it's such a new oration, um, and I think this is the only the second one, um, which is good, because uh, it means that I'll definitely be in the top two by the end of the night. Uh, and so you've got to get in early with these things. Um, also, you get to set the tone, and so before this becomes a really stiff, formal event where everyone's in tuxedos or robes, um, I'm going to make this as informal as possible. Uh, and then that's going to screw it up for everyone else that has to come after me, and I'll take some delight from that. I think I know roughly how these things are meant to go. So my understanding is I'm meant to get up here and talk about how human rights are really important and they're under threat, and then maybe cite as many examples as I can think of from, I don't know, asylum seeker policy, uh, and then sit down. Uh, although there's a Q&A thing that will intervene, but you get the picture. That's the general arc of these things. And I, I'm going to break with convention, although, as I say, only the second one, there is no convention. Um, I'm going to break with whatever convention there is by not doing that today. I, I'm not going to um, undergo some kind of list of all the ways in which human rights are under threat and all the ways in which they're continually violated and all the different spheres uh, in which they are. Because I think that's what everybody would do. And also because um, there are just so many areas you could look at. Like for example, like when I was in the, uh, in a, the, like getting on the plane to come here today, I ran into an academic who was a legal academic from uh, Melbourne University. And her expertise is obviously in administrative law and she was passionately telling me about this problem that is emerging within administrative law, um, whereby legislation is subtly being passed that allows the responsible minister to have discretion as to whether or not they even need to consider your particular application. So for those of you who are into administrative law, and I'm sure that's everybody, right? This is a really significant thing. So this is, this is not, so let's, let's take the area of immigration where this is probably most common. Um, what this means is not that uh, I submit an application for a visa, whether as a refugee or as a skilled migrant or whatever. I submit my application for a visa and then the minister has to consider that and they might have a discretion ultimately as to whether or not they grant me the visa, but they have to think about it. Now we're starting to see the introduction on, of mechanisms whereby the minister has a discretion as to whether or not they will even pay attention to the fact that you've made the application, which is extraordinary. This is like a minister getting to choose whether or not they're going to enter into a relationship with you. Um, and in immigration, that's one thing, but we're now starting to see that in areas like welfare policy, right? Um, I should point out, I know nothing about this. I'm just regurgitating what I heard this morning uh, before I got on my plane, but it's just an illustration of the kinds of areas where these sorts of questions about the erosion of human rights is live, and the thing is they're live in all kinds of areas. But I also know that when I go to work on Monday um, or at Channel 10, or I go to work uh, at 
the ABC on Wednesday to do my radio show, I almost certainly will not be speaking about something like that. And the reason I will not be speaking about something like that is, well, frankly, nobody cares. And this is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk not about all the instances in which human rights might be being compromised or overlooked. I'm interested in the fact that no one cares about that. I'm interested in the fact that this has become among the singularly most unpersuasive things you could possibly say about something. That this is a breach of human rights. That Australia is in breach of its human rights obligations. How many times have you heard that sentence in media reports over, I don't know, five years? Pick your time frame. Honestly, how many times have you heard that? And how many times have you seen a single thing come from it? I, I think, didn't Amnesty go so far as to describe our current asylum seeker arrangements as approaching torture, or at the very least as breaching the Convention on Torture? Where did that go? Why does it didn't, didn't go anywhere. Nothing flowed from that. I think the Prime Minister said something angry about it. That's it. I think I wrote an article about it, which was good for me, but it didn't help anybody else. Nothing happens. There's no interest, really, um, in any of this. So the point, really, the starting point for what I want to talk about today is that people, and certainly politics, now seem to have entered a phase where they're just completely unmoved by human rights as an idea. And why has that happened? And is there anything that can be done about that? Um, I think it's interesting or it's important to think about that. Whether or not you can remedy this in the short term or even the medium or long term, but I think it's important to think about this. Because, it, well, take it as a case study of some broader phenomena in politics that I think are important for us to understand. And I would frame it this way. I would say that the reason that we are in this situation, where there is simply no political purchase that attaches to human rights claims, is that no one seems to know or remember or bother articulating the philosophical foundations of human rights in the first place. In other words, we keep hearing these claims of human rights violations, breaches of human rights violations, breaches of conventions that have just interminably long names. We keep hearing this. But beyond knowing that it's apparently a breach of something, I don't think we really have any understanding of what that's meant to mean. What, what have we actually breached? What's the point of what we've breached? What's the meaning of having violated some kind of... Like, it sounds heavy, right? Human rights, like it's is, it sounds like it's the top of the tree. But when you keep hearing it, you become desensitised to it. And then at some point you probably need to know what the deep philosophical idea it is, or is that you're meant to have breached. So, if in the absence of that, what tends to happen is that human rights becomes a claim amongst other claims. There are human rights, there are property rights, there are all manners of rights, and they all compete, and then we kind of just resolve them via the crude mechanisms of politics as we have uh, at our disposal, and that's pretty much what happens. In fact, you, and, and I think this is partly why we have this phenomenon that I think is easily observable at the moment, where far from human rights becoming persuasive in a political way, or even decisive, determinative in a political way, really what happens is defying them becomes a badge of honour within the context of certain political movements. Uh, am I remembering correctly that one of the many times that the United Nations Special Rapporteur made adverse comment about Australia's human rights um, record on Indigenous people and, in, and on asylum seekers. Uh, Tony Abbott, who was then Prime Minister, responded by saying, I think most Australians would just like to see the UN butt out. So I, I didn't make that up, right? That's, that happened. Yeah? Enough people are nodding for me to take that as a fact check. Good. 
uh, it's remarkable the confidence with which that can be said. <laughs> right? that, that to me is more remarkable than anything that the UN actually said. It's the way in which the response to that can be, well, you know, we will consider the UN's report and of course we disagree with its conclusions. But like, like I can come up with the script that the kind of polite, genteel script to respond to, I, I, could, I could come up with it. I think I've heard it quite a lot of times in, in my working life. But uh, what, what's amazing was just the total abandonment of it. Forget the script. I don't need to read the report. The UN should just butt out. What's the UN got to say about anything? I don't want to pay attention to what... They're just wasting our time. They're just getting in our business. That's a brand of politics. That's... We, we've seen it over and over and we'd be... It wouldn't be hard at all to pick people within probably all the great democracies of the world, within the major parties of the great democracies of the world that have uttered statements like this. One of the things that I think is so fascinating about the way in which human rights is treated at the moment is that we're very good at holding on to them until such a point as they have some kind of meaning, until such a point that circumstances conspire to ask us to enact them, to sacrifice something to enact them, at that point we don't seem to like them very much. Even something as fundamental as the norm against torture. I mean, this is a peremptory norm. This, this is a human rights norm that is meant to apply whether you signed up to anything or not, uh, under any circumstances. That there, there is, in, in other words, if you ask human rights lawyers about this, they will tell you that you can't opt out of this. And there is no circumstance that justifies a resort to none. Like we've thought them through. Don't come to us with a new circumstance and say, yeah, but something's about to, I've got to, we've got to torture this. But no, no, we've thought through that. We know that. And we've said, you, you still can't do it. And that this is such a fundamental human right that you don't even need to agree with it for it to be something that we consider as applying. There's no convention that you have to sign in order to be bound by this idea. It's that powerful a norm. And yet, we're quite happy to violate it. Liberal democracy is happy to violate it. I mean, if we were giving a speech like this in the United States, this would be a much more live concept for us, you would have thought a lot more about it because it's been a very common touchstone of American politics, this debate over what, um, what constitutes torture, of course, and then what counts as its legitimate use. And one of the things that Barack Obama came to power uh, upon was this wave of disgust within the United States at what had happened in Guantanamo Bay and this idea of rolling back this use of torture. And then, of course, it all turned very quickly. Um, uh, earlier today, I was reminded of some of the Republican primary debates, which are amazing to listen to. <laughs> like, even now, they're amazing to listen to, where you hear arguments about what torture actually means, uh, and then you hear Donald Trump just cut through all those arguments just by saying, I, I, I'd, I think, what did, he, what did he say? I would bring back waterboarding, and I tell you what, I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse. And then cheers erupt from the audience, right? Um, and of course, there will be arguments that people will make about something like the legitimacy of the use of torture under certain circumstances and so on. But that's the thing with human rights breaches, even the really big ones, is that the reason they exist is because there are circumstances where people want to argue they should be suspended. That's the point. It's not hard not to torture somebody when you can't think of a reason to do it. <laughs> the whole point of having a prohibition against torture is that you might want to do it. That's why it's there. I mean, if I were to stand here and say, I, I hereby prohibit all of you from flying, you'd probably sit there and say, oh, well, sure. But if I give you wings, suddenly that prohibition means something. Right? And it's the same sort of thing with human rights discourse. We tend to see this pattern where it's fine to support human rights until such a moment as we actually don't want to. And it's at that moment we find out whether they mean much to us. I often think about this, um, and I know I wasn't, 
I said I wasn't going to bang on about the asylum seeker debate or something, but I'll just use it as an example every now and again. I think the, the approach to asylum seekers is an interesting um, case in point here. We accept, generally speaking, if you were to, I don't know, survey in the abstract, or take the temperature of the political community, we accept the basic ideas of prohibitions on arbitrary detention, for example, accept the basic ideas of the Refugee Convention, um, although that might be waning a little bit now, but we basically accept those things. But at the moment of application, at the moment where we're being put in a tight spot on it, at a moment where there is a counter argument to be made along the lines of, I don't know, say the deaths at sea argument or something like that, at that moment, it's, what's interesting is how easy we find it to distance ourselves from those ideas. So I'm not just interested in the fact that we're doing it, I'm interested in the fact that we do it so easily. What does that tell us? What does that mean? And the asylum seeker case is a really interesting one. Actually, the deaths at sea argument, I think, is a really interesting one. Because if you, if you think about the deaths at sea argument, it's kind of framed in these terms. We must deter other people by punishing these people. So we are quite explicitly not trying to resolve their situation. That's not the aim. The aim is to visit punishment upon them so that other people don't act in ways that will harm themselves, like get on boats where they might drown. All right, and the politicians who assess the issue in this way will assess it by citing the number of people who've died at sea. Maybe if they're former immigration ministers, they'll even cite the number of people who died at sea on their watch and the moral burden that that places upon them, how heavily they feel that burden and all of those sorts of things. And I don't deny that a lot of that is genuine. That's not my argument here. I'm interested in the mode of reasoning. It's an interesting mode of reasoning because we don't seem to apply it to anything else. We don't, for example, <laughs> say, well, smoking kills a lot of people. So I'm going to pick a thousand smokers and I'm going to torture them. as a way of deterring, I'm going to break the tobacco seller's business model and I'm going to deter those who come after them. Like, now, I get there are differences in the, I'm not saying these are exactly the same case, but the mode of reasoning is that. And when you move it out of the asylum seeker case where the debate has kind of evolved to that point, we kind of forget that we didn't start anywhere near there. We've kind of got to a point where that's become conventional wisdom. It's taken probably 15 years for us to get to that point. But when you take it out of that context and you put it in another context where we don't reason that way, it just feels really alien. You take it, um, another example that uh, is not, perhaps not as shocking as the smoking example. Um, organ donation. We, we do not have an opt-out system for organ donation. We have an opt-in system. That is, because I believe or the law holds your body to be sacred in some kind of way, or at the very least, your property, if we want to make it a proprietary thing, because of that, it would be a transgression for the state to have access to your organs without your, you giving permission. And I know there are people advocating for an opt-out and whatever, I, I get that, but as it stands, that's not what we do. But who can deny that if we flip that and if we said your body becomes state property upon death and the state can treat it as it wishes and it can take your organs without any consent and you have to lodge a complaint, if you don't want, to, don't want that to happen, you have to protest before death or after if you can manage it, but you probably... Um, you, and if you don't do that, then it's state property, we just take your organs. Who can deny if we had a system like that, it would save a lot of lives? It would. But we don't reason in that utilitarian way about these things because the point, well, I was going to say the point of human rights, but actually the point of liberalism, and there's an argument that human rights is an outgrowth of that, which 
can get a lot of human rights theorists fired up, but leave that to one side. The point of liberalism is that we don't actually make decisions on whether we can save more lives by harming a group of people. We hold each of those people to have something inalienable about them, such that they can't be sacrificed for the good of somebody else, or for the good of three other people, or five other people. That is, we don't do a calculus like that. That's not how we reason. And yet, on the asylum seeker case, that's precisely how we reason. Uh, that's, that's the moral reasoning. That's the compassionate reasoning, right? So when we present what we're doing as a form of compassion, that's how we present it. It's a utilitarian thing. At which point, I'm kind of tempted to say, okay, let's be utilitarian, and just everything becomes utilitarian after that. But that would lead to all kinds of examples, all kinds of policies that are very different from what we have now. And people would probably not like it all of a sudden because they would find that their rights are being subordinated to what in the mind of someone else is a greater claim of other people. We tend not to like reasoning that way. But the reason we can reason that way in this case, I think, is because this idea that I've just articulated of every human being having something inalienable about them is no longer an idea that means very much. Like if I were to poll this room and say, do you believe in the sanctity of the human being? And then ask you to give your reason, there would probably be no consensus on what the reason for that was. Or to put it another way, if you were caught in a probably uncomfortable conversation with somebody who just didn't want to accept the sanctity of the human being, what would your answer be? Or, to make it more broad, what would the answer of those who value human rights be to the question, why is this sacred? From where does this idea of a human right spring? Like, what's the basis of it? You're telling me I can't harm this person for my benefit or for the benefit of other people. Why not? Really, why? On what basis can I not do that? And I think because so many of the foundational human rights instruments and conventions that we talk about now arose out of a period of history where that question kind of was self-evident. Well, the answer to that question was self-evident. We'd seen World War II. We'd seen what happens when people are treated more or less as chattels. And so we revived this idea of people being somehow sacred or inviolable or having some kind of inalienable set of rights that couldn't be done away with for political expediency. I think because a lot of that was kind of fresh, we didn't need to do a huge amount of theoretical work or have a whole lot of public theoretical conversations about this. It was kind of intuitive, but it's not intuitive now. Not while we're prepared to sacrifice a group of people for another group of people. As a moral thing to do. Right? This is different. Sacrificing a group of people for another as a just pragmatic political calculation, that's one thing. Doing it as a moral commitment is something else. And the fact that we can do that now as a moral commitment means that this idea of the human being having rights that are somehow inherent is thin. And as it thins out, human rights become something that police things, but they don't become something that means anything. And hence, human rights becomes a claim amongst other claims. Oh, the human rights lawyers don't like it because they look at things always through these conventions that they talk about, and that's just the way they talk about everything. It's a, a perspective from amongst the perspectives. Um, what we don't have, it seems, certainly not in popular discourse, is 
a theoretical foundation for talking about what makes a human being special. So if, for example, uh, you were a Christian, and I'm, I'm not a Christian, but my understanding of Christian theology, I think, goes far enough to be able to say this. If you were a Christian, you could articulate something fairly clear. Human beings are created in the image of God, uh, therefore they are imbued with something of divinity, therefore a defilement of the human being is a defilement of the divine. So there's a really clear narrative that helps explain why the human being, an individual human being, is sacred in some way. Now, I'm not saying that that would never be violated within a religious paradigm, but it's there. It makes sense. There's a coherence to it. It's logical. There's a philosophical basis on which I can now assert the inviolability of the human being. But as our society has secularised more and more, what's replacing that? If we're not talking about a human being that's imbued with some kind of divine light, then what is the human being? Where, what, what is it about them that makes them any more sacred to another collection of cells? I mean, each one of us in a room on our own could maybe come up with something. But I think what's interesting is that there's no obvious answer that's occurring in all of your minds right now. And what I want to suggest is that in the absence of an answer like that, human rights remains vulnerable. And that is part of the reason, if not a very big part of the reason, that human rights become politically dispensable. Because there's not political purchase that's attached to this claim that they make. Now, to be fair, this is a problem that pervades politics generally. I would say this is a problem that has evolved over the last 30, 40 years, particularly in uh, Western liberal democracies. And by that, I'm really talking about the period of time that flows from the end of the Cold War when all of the great conflicts of politics, all of the great ideological conflicts were resolved and the world agreed on how to run a perfect society. And that was through the model of liberal democracy. The application, not just of liberalism really, but of neoliberalism, of a renewed liberalism that posited market-style thinking as the way to make decisions, the way to make political decisions. Um, and that's why, and I recognise I'm being impossibly crude here, but that's why if you were to look at the evolution of particularly Western societies over the last 30, 40 years, you would have to summarise it by saying in economic terms, the right one by being liberal and the liberalisation of markets and so on, the slow erosion of collective restraints on the market like union power or whatever it is, and in cultural terms and social terms, the left one, um, with the slow liberalisation of social attitudes to just about everything. Um, I can't think really of a compelling alternative account of the way that politics has evolved over the last 30 years. But what's interesting about that is not about what the left one and what the right one, and uh, you know, anyone who has read some of my more obscure work would know that I actually can't stand either of those terms, and I think they mean nothing. But what's interesting is that in both cases, liberalism won. Whether it was economic liberalism or social liberalism, it was liberalism that won. The idea of liberalising everything. Liberalism at its heart is a, a political philosophy that holds that the individual prevails over the collective that the aim of politics is really to maximise the freedom of the individual. And the collective uh, can't override that with their claims, that that would just be mob rule, um, and so it would lead ultimately to tyranny. But something happens when you 
expand liberalism in the way that we've done over the last three or four decades. And that is that it starts to change from being something that is culturally embedded. That is, that we preserve the right of the individual, but we understand that those individual rights exist within a cultural framework that is shared. And we start to apply a kind of market rationality to everything. What begins to emerge is a new expression of liberalism that is acultural, that's amoral, that's not really about preserving any kind of moral or cultural consensus or moral or cultural bedrock out of which individual liberty might spring, but is actually ambivalent on questions of morality or culture. So how do you determine morality within this scheme? Well, you determine it more or less by market mechanisms. If a market exists for it, then there's sufficient consensus for this particular moral commitment to exist. So the example I often use uh, to illustrate this point, just because when I first saw it, it kind of was the one that made me pause, was consider the case of um, companies coming up with hyper-sexualized clothing for kids. Uh, there was a report done on this, I don't know, five years ago, um, maybe a bit longer, uh, coined the term corporate pedophilia, I think. But you might have seen this. Anyone who's got little kids would have come across this at some point. You know, G-strings for six-year-olds and all kinds of sexually loaded messages on clothing for kids and stuff like that. Now, as a society, what's our reaction to that? Well, if you take the consensus of society over 30, 40 years, where you've had economic liberalism win and social liberalism win, then the answer to that is, well, there's a market for it. It keeps going. That's, and that's what's happening. <laughs> what was fascinating was to watch the free market cultural conservatives try to figure out what to do about this. Like, what, I, 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 uh, uh, it was fascinating to watch. Um, the response seemed to be support the free market and blame this kind of social evolution on the cultural left. Well, that's convenient. It's not entirely stupid either, but it, that was kind of the resolution. But every, the consensus seems to be, well, wave it through, no problem. Like we can might like, whinge about it a bit, but not really a problem. So the point I want to make here is that when you take on in quite a deep way this method of social and political reasoning, you kind of end up with a political and social conversation that, you know, with complaints here and there and a bit of resistance here and there, largely boils down to, I guess, three basic ideas. One is efficiency. Um, two is non-harm, or what you might call a negative version of freedom, the classic liberal conception. That is, as the cliche goes, you might have heard it before, that my freedom to swing my fist ends where your nose begins. That sort of idea. Um, and the idea of non-discrimination. And as a society, if you think about how we publicly reason, Pretty much every debate seems to collapse back on <laughs> those three ideas, doesn't it? I mean, there might be others I'm missing, but I can't think of them immediately. The ones that come very easily to hand are those three. Efficiency, non-harm, uh, and harm in a fairly really restricted sense, um, and non-discrimination. And that's kind of the way... We, so how often do you hear this? Um, you can do whatever you want as long as it's not harming anybody else. Right. What's interesting about that is not that, I mean, that's just, that's straight up and down liberalism, and there's a lot to commend that, by the way. But as a form of political reasoning, that makes sense. What's interesting is that's kind of become how we reason socially and morally as well. So what's happening there is that a whole language and a whole mode of reasoning is kind of disappearing. And the things that are disappearing in that mode of reasoning and in that language are really anything that is, to use the term that I'm using for the purposes of this <laughs> presentation, anything that's more enchanted than that. 
the, all those three notions, efficiency, non-harm, non-discrimination, the only one of those that is positive or has content really is efficiency. The others are about not doing things. Even the idea of freedom is a negative idea because it's a negatively defined freedom. So um, we get out of your way. So it's non-interference as much as it's anything else. It's not positive freedom. A positive notion of freedom would be, for example, um, I'm going to build a fence uh, at the edge of a cliff to stop you throwing yourself off it so that you can more fully, lead a, you know, more fully live your life and fulfill your potential. That would be a more positive version of freedom. A negative version of freedom would be tear down the fence. You want to jump off? Your decision. Right? They're the kind of different. That's really crude, but... Um, and so we adopt this negative version of freedom. We have non-discrimination as probably one of the biggest principles in our society now. Uh, and efficiency becomes really the only positive value that's there. Um, and so, and in this, throughout this process, what that triumph of liberalism has kind of meant is that all of the meaning-giving institutions of our lives have kind of slowly started to lose their purchase on our imagination. So think, for example, of the role of the church in our public reasoning at the moment. I can't recall a time, certainly not in my life, and probably not in my parents' life, um, a bad example, that came from Egypt. The church wasn't an institution that mattered in Egypt in quite the same way, but you know what I'm saying. Throughout the course of this century, really, I can't recall a time where the church has had less persuasive power. Any church. I'm not even saying, like, you know, the, the, the sandstone churches with the biggest robes and the, the, you know, the most potent incense and all. I don't mean that. I mean any church. It's lost its purchase. Um, family. One of the consequences of the economic side of our liberalism has, has been a real change to the way that we go about working, a real change to the availability that we have to have for non-family things, which has an impact on the way that family must operate. And you start to see family change. It operates in a different kind of a way. Family relationships are much harder to sustain. Things are not built around the idea of family time in the way they were. This is why we have a penalty rates argument that goes on. And the thing that astonishes me, this is just an aside now, but the thing that astonishes me about the penalty rates argument is that it really is no longer sustainable to have a penalty rates argument that's actually about life on Sunday. You couldn't do it. You could try, but you couldn't really do it. So the only way to have the penalty rates argument now is to make it about taking money away from low-earning people. But Sunday is not Sunday. Everyone kind of admits that now. Because the things, the structures of our lives that once protected these kind of institutions that I'm, again, crudely describing as meaning-giving institutions have changed. So, and you could even throw into this the, the presence of the union. Um, although it's a slightly different thing, but there were sort of meaning-giving structures within unions. Unions meant something more than just negotiation. There were notions of solidarity that were bound up in that, so on and so forth. So in this process what I, that I'm trying to describe, I think what's happening is that those things that are enchanted disappear. Those things that have a meaning that's, that seems somehow grander or attached to some overarching mythology or even an ontology, these things slowly start to disappear and they become replaced with a series of ideas that are really about abstract rights. So something like non-discrimination, abstract right. Uh, things like freedom given by non-interference, abstract right. Things like efficiency, well that's an abstract organisational principle, but really abstract rights came to replace things that were thicker, more emotional. Th even things like solidarity. The very idea of solidarity is an idea that it kind of sounds old now. 
And I guess it's because it is. And then what flows from that is that our lives kind of enter and our social organisations kind of enter a transactional phase. I get these rights in a transaction from the government who confer these rights upon me and I confer upon them the legitimacy to govern over me because of that. And then I might take those rights and I might seek to barter them away in a contractual arrangement uh, because I can earn more money by doing that over here. And then society benefits because if we allow these kind of transactional arrangements, then we end up getting a more efficient uh, organisation of social and economic affairs. It kind of becomes transactional. We become a bit more atomised in that way. What can I get out of this? What do I have to give you to get the thing that I want out of this? I become recast, not as a member within a solidarity group, not as a citizen within a broader polity, but kind of as a consumer within a broader set of relationships, transactional relationships, or as an entrepreneur who's trying to figure out how I can navigate my way through this social world in a way that will benefit me most. And by the way, um, I'm, not, I'm not immune from this. I'm not trying to make a claim about the decisions that we make as people. I'm talking about the, the sort of the prevailing social and political systems that operate as we make these decisions. And so this kind of transactional phase that we've entered into, I think over time has led us to a situation where it becomes difficult for us actually to think through concepts like solidarity because we've kind of forgotten how to cultivate solidarity and empathy and these sorts of ideas between people. That, that sort of takes practice. <laughs> And we're falling out of practice with that. And falling out of practice for good reason, because it's not really helping us. Not in our day-to-day -day lives. So, you know, I was about to go on a tangent about lean-in feminism and stuff like that, but I'll leave that away for Q&A or something. Um, if not here, then maybe the show. <laughs> So what I'm describing though, or at least what I'm trying to describe, is a relatively new thing. As I said, 30, 40 years. And it's always been a bit tenuous. I think at some level, we kind of all understand that what I'm describing in a particularly kind of blunt way is not something that anyone would put their hand up and say, yes, this is what I, what I want. And so we've kind of, through this process, always had outbreaks of what I'm describing as more enchanted political ideas. And usually they take the form of nationalist posing. So, you know, values tests and things like that. The recent citizenship tests and that sort of values talk, this is not new. Do you guys remember when the Howard government tried to do a similar thing? Hands up if you remember that. Yeah, okay, pretty much everybody. One of the things I loved about when the Howard government did it, and you had that whole stuff about Bradman's average and all this stuff, remember that? One of the things I loved, which I don't think was actually one of the questions, it just caught on, I think, because there was a headline in the Herald Sun about it or something. But um, one of the things that I loved about that period was the way in which it was announced. So the Howard government found a way to announce the citizenship test like five times. First, we're, here is the committee that's going to look at it, and then this is the committee's decision on what it is. And then third announcement, we're going to do it. And then fourth announcement, um, it's in the budget. And out of the whole budget of whatever year it was, there was a separate press release saying $120 million or whatever it was set aside for the new citizenship test. It's like it just kept getting press released. It was just the one initiative, but it was announced over and over and over again. And what these are, these are kind of symbolic um, nationalist interventions kind of sprinkled throughout our politics at the same time as something like work choices is going on. Right? So we get these sprinklings of these things. It's a similar story in the United States with the way that Republican politics evolved. But if you think about something like a citizenship test, it's a fascinating idea, actually. What is that appealing to? What is, that, what is it that makes us hear that? Maybe not you, but it makes a lot of people 
hear that and it hits them in the gut and it feels satisfying? Well, part of it is a kind of, we'll make sure we get the good people, not the bad people kind of impulse. But part of it is it's an articulation of a glue. It's an expression of, like it's a mechanism for the reinvention or rediscovery of this solidarity that is kind of not there in the way that it used to be. And so it feels good. There's something emotional about it. It's enchanted. It's got meaning, even if it doesn't. Because one of the other changes that came along with the citizenship change was that when you added up all the different mechanisms to citizenship, it actually made it shorter waiting time and it made it easier to get. But that wasn't the press release. The press release was the citizenship change over and over and over again, the test, the mechanism for solidarity. So it's always been tenuous and you've had these kind of breakouts with people, um, these breakouts, sort of these tokens of, of meaning seeking mechanisms that we've had in our lives that we could kind of latch onto. But generally speaking, this, um, this new form of social and political reasoning that had been scrubbed clean of whatever it was that was enchanted about our lives has kind of prevailed. But the thing about that, even though it's always been tenuous, I think it becomes especially fragile when you enter a period where the economic side of it, the economic story no longer holds the way that it used to. It was an easier thing to get on board with and feel sated by as long as you felt that you were winning an economic battle in some way. But we are now, and Australia less than other places, entering a phase where that economic battle is not being won. The United States is, of course, the classic example. We are, in Australia now, beginning to have a conversation about wage stagnation, for example. We're having conversations about wages not having um, risen in Australia on average for about six years. I imagine you have conversations that are even more pointed about it in a state like this, which is a boom-bust state. In the United States, they're having conversations about wages not having gone anywhere for 30 years. That's a totally different order of conversation. What's interesting about that is not that that bothers people, that, that you would expect, but that that becomes a, a bit of an existential crisis when you've created a social and political order that is about really little more than that. Where do you go where that bit of it isn't working? And when that happens, and you've got this whole other aspect of, of social life where that has been really about the field where meaning is given to people. So not their material circumstances necessarily, but the meaning that they can attribute to those circumstances. The kind of airy-fairy conversations that we don't do in politics. Um, once that had been hollowed out and the economic side of the story wasn't working anymore, then what happens is just a massive vacuum. Because people, being human beings who like having stories to tell themselves about who they are and why they are, will find someone to tell it. I think what we've seen in the past couple of years that has stopped so many people in their tracks has just been the story of watching people tell people a story. Give them a story about themselves that they can latch onto. Take that field of meaning giving that has been slowly eroded or perhaps even vacated and fill it. That's what I really think is going on here. There are lots of other analyses that you can come up with, uh, and indeed that I have written and spoken before, that can fill the breach. But this is the element of it that I think goes too ignored, that goes unremarked too often. And the people who can fill this vacuum are going to be populist. And they're really good at it. And you know why they're really good at it? Because if you think about what they're offering, whether it be through the rhetoric of stronger borders, 
uh, illegal immigration, cracking down on crime, um, which the code for which is usually crime inflicted by minorities, so on and so forth. Whatever the language of it is, they are providing something that is instant. It's an instant narrative. It appears historic. It is therefore rooted. It is anchored. It connects you to people around you like that. And it connects you to people in history instantly. That's powerful. And that, that's the strongest form of enchantment there is. The story that is being told to you at that point is not just about you. It's about you in relation to the cosmos. It's about you in relation to history. It's about you in relation to a large group of people that are around you. It's about solidarity. And there are different ways of building solidarity. And some of those ways are more positive and constructive than others. But in the absence of too many alternatives, there's only going to be one winner. And I can't help and it, this probably hit me most strongly last year when I was in the United States for the election and I was uh, standing there at a Trump rally surrounded by all the Trump supporters and they're chanting, lock her up and all that sort of stuff. And these were lovely people, by the way. It was astonishing to watch. Some of the nicest people I've ever met. Uh, and then suddenly, just lock her up. That was amazing, amazing transformation. But it was at that point the feeling that you get at a place like that, uh, even though it's fair to say I wasn't broadly sympathetic with their worldview, and they weren't sympathetic with, I was going to say my existence, but perhaps that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair, because they were actually quite lovely to me. Um, I think the fact that I was Australian really helped. <laughs> Make of that whatever you will. but. What I got was that this was charged. This was a way of quite thick, profound connection with people. It felt great. Even I enjoyed it. I'm interviewing this woman and I'm saying, what makes you like Donald Trump so much? And she's like, oh, uh, I think we need to kick all the Muslims out. And I'm saying, oh, thank you very much for joining. <laughs> It's amazing. And I'm talking to this and even I enjoyed it. <laughs> because there was something on offer there. There was a, there was a thick form of, social, of solidarity that was being built there. Suddenly the individual within that crowd was so much more than the consumer who now couldn't buy anything. And they were so much more than the entrepreneur who now was not in a position to create anything. Um, and they were so much more than a vessel for abstract rights which they could only understand if they went to a university like this. And given that they were white working class men, a lot of them, the, the abstract rights discourse was not something that had touched them particularly personally. It's not like they'd seen an emancipation in their lives or anything like that. So they were suddenly part of something that gave them instant meaning, historic meaning, contemporary social meaning, thick meaning. And I think we can't underestimate the power of that. But more than that, we can't underestimate the human need for that. But the thing about a lot of these populist narratives, and this has been true throughout history, is that they are modern concoctions. They are, they are not things that are, they're not they're like soberly worked out analyses by scholars and historians that have just grown over time and eventually reached a critical mass of support. That's not what they are. They are political creations that are usually quite recent in the way that they're created, but they talk an ancient language. But they, because they offer an instant solidarity, one of the quickest ways to do that is via scapegoating and via exclusion and via pointing out enemy minorities and all that sort of stuff. That's just a shortcut. That's not the only way you can create solidarity, but that's just a shortcut. And in a field that's been vacated for so long, if you want to do that quickly, that's a really, really good way of doing it. All right, good's not probably the right word. That's a really, really efficient way of doing it. And human rights as an idea is going to lose in this context. That's why no one cares. Because over the course of time, and as we've forgotten a lot of the reason that human rights in the form that we have it now was kind of dreamt up, 
they have become more abstract ideas. They are abstract rights, like non-discrimination. They're going to hit you in the gut. When I talk about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, you're unlikely to feel inspired to storm a barricade. You're more likely to fall asleep by the time I get to the end of the title. And lawyers, of course, being in charge of this is the worst, because they love titles like that. I know, because I was one. So human rights is going to lose in that contest, because it's an abstract, it's, a, it's about abstract rights, it's part of a package of sort of globalized, sort of anti-localized um, ideas that are not connected with the meaning-giving institutions of our lives. But that's why I think it's so easy for Tony Abbott to say it would be great for the UN to stop lecturing us. That's what Australians want. You think about that statement, it's so potent, it's so brilliant. The UN should stop lecturing us. This sort of globalised group of people who are not of us, who talk about these abstract ideas that are not our ideas, they should butt out so we can get on with our sovereignty, so that we can get on with us. Tell me there's not a tiny little bit of you that finds that attractive. You might have buried it a long way, but there's... It's there. That's why it works. Because it's enchanted. Because <laughs> there's something in it. And that's why I think that the whole idea of human rights and all the institutions that talk about human rights are so easily just packaged up with this global elite idea that can then be disparaged. And that's why no one needs to listen. Because you just become recategorized in this way and, that, and that's that. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, none of this is to say human rights is just an irrelevant concept. I think what I'm trying to say is that human rights recovers its political ground by discovering a way to become enchanted. And I think that become, I think the only way to that is the rediscovery and the cultivation of the very notion of solidarity, of the notion of what it is about the human being that's significant and what it is that's meant to connect me with somebody else, such that their human rights are somehow a reflection of mine. Now that's easy to say, by the way, much harder to do. But as long as human rights remains a kind of abstract notion, a set of ideas that lawyers bang on about, um, it's not that they will be irrelevant. It's not that courts will suddenly refuse to hear them. It's not any of that. And it's not that it will not create stimulating conversations and analyses and perhaps even quite powerful analyses in universities around the world or whatever it might be, even in media. But it's going to be hard to move lots of people at an emotional level when it's up against something else that's so potent. That's the challenge before us. Um, so as a guest of a centre that deals with human rights, I would say to the people who run that centre, good luck. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for having me.